Hello everyone. Today our webinar summary is about genetic diversity. Why a summary? Because this is usually a very detailed webinar. If what you see here is not enough for you, you can always join our other webinars. I have brought a few practical examples, especially for growers who work with our MyFerrigan platform. I'll try to give you an idea of what the information means and how to make sense of it. In the end, it should help you to get the most out of your breeding. Genetic diversity has become increasingly important in dog breeding in recent years. Fortunately, the topic has already arrived in the breeding clubs. The genetic diversity or genetic variance of our dogs is basically nothing more than a toolbox. If you are a craftsman, then you need to have several tools to be able to build a variety of things. The more diverse your tools, the more possibilities you have. If you only have a hammer, you can hammer a nail into the wall, but you can't drive a screw into it. It is the same with genetic variants or genetic equipment. In other words, the greater the diversity, the better equipped an individual is no matter what comes from outside. If the genetic variance is low, then you only have the bare minimum of genetic equipment. This is fine if the requirements are not high. But if the environmental conditions change, you are very limited. Environmental conditions are things that we and our dogs come into contact with or are confronted with on a daily basis. If you don't have the right genetic equipment, this can manifest itself in functional disorders and subsequently in illness. Preserving genetic variance is a very important factor in avoiding genetic diseases. We also talk a lot about complex diseases. You know the stories of autoimmune diseases. You know the issues of allergies. Of various types of cancer. These are mostly diseases that cannot be traced back to a single gene, they have a very complex basis. Many genes are often involved and there are also environmental factors. In terms of testing for such diseases, we are very limited and very restricted. So we need solutions to get around this. We can do this by trying to maintain a high level of genetic diversity in breeding. What are the positive effects of high genetic diversity? On the one hand, we have a reduction in inbreeding depression. This means a minimization of negative factors associated with inbreeding. We have a reduction in genetic defects. This means that if I have a diverse gene pool, I can dilute potentially harmful recessive genes and thus reduce the likelihood of harmful genes from both parents coming together. A high genetic variance strengthens the immune response. This means that high diversity contributes to a robust immune response. It is advantageous when confronted with pathogens if there is a significantly more diverse range of immune system variants. These are certain factors in the immune system that are responsible for recognizing pathogens and ultimately eliminating them. This significantly improves the fight against diseases. Then we have the issue of adaptability. An issue that we see again and again with a loss of genetic diversity is a loss of adaptability. Genetic diversity enables populations to adapt better to environmental changes. I always like to compare this with plants. Imagine you are a plant standing in your garden. You are confronted with heat, snow, rain and drought, which means that you need to have a good genetic endowment so that you can withstand all these factors. That is why it is so important to maintain genetic diversity. When we talk about genetic diversity, we can basically look at the whole thing on two levels. We can look at it from the perspective of certain genes, but we'll leave those out for now. These are the so-called DLA genes. Today we want to look at the rest of the dog, in other words the rest of the genetics that are, so to speak, buzzing around in the dog's DNA. This means that we are not looking at individual genes, but at thousands of genetic markers that are distributed throughout the dog's DNA. What is the aim of all this? We want to determine the genetic diversity of a dog. We want to calculate COI values of dogs, not on a pedigree basis as we have done so far, but on the basis of the genetic markers that we have tested from a dog. You can imagine it like this, this genetic test is basically comparable to a classic genetic test, in which the DNA is really examined for certain areas. These areas are then used for various evaluations that should give you as a breeder important information. We also want to find dogs with a low genetic relationship because this can be used sensibly in breeding. I will explain how this works in a moment. These diversity tests, as we carry them out, are a kind of modern breeding management. What is the purpose behind it? We want to collect genetic data. We want to get an overview of the genetic conditions in a breed. 
we then want to convert this information into forward-looking breeding management in order to make optimum, long-term use of a breed's genetic resources. At the same time, we also get important information about the individual dogs in a breed, but also about the breed itself in comparison to other breeds. This gives us an idea of where we stand as breeders and where the breed club stands. We have developed our MyForagen platform over the last year and a half and it is still being developed further. With the platform, we have created a way to visualize and collect genetic data. The platform allows the collection of health data, genetic characteristics, but also diversity data or DNA profiles of dogs, for example. The diversity data includes the heterozygosity values. We look at the percentage of the genetic markers examined that were passed on differently from the mother and father to the offspring. The number of markers is decisive for the accuracy. This means that the more markers I examine, the more accurately I can say how large this percentage is. And at this point I would like to point out that DNA profiles are not suitable for such statements. DNA profiles generally have far too few markers. You really need a significantly larger number of genetic markers to be able to make good statements here. Heterozygosity value is often referred to as the value for genetic diversity. In truth, it is not by definition. Genetic diversity is a somewhat more complex form of calculation. Let's just accept that genetic diversity is usually expressed differently than in the heterozygosity value. It is at least a step in the right direction. When we talk about heterozygosity values, we are also talking about the fact that these values vary depending on the breed and the degree of inbreeding in the breed. Basically, the higher this percentage value is, the higher the degree of heterozygosity and, with caution and in quotation marks, the higher the genetic diversity. What we see in this slide are heterozygosity values of three different varieties of the Belgian Shepherd dog. A Gronendale, a Tervuren and a Malinois. We can really see deviations of different percentages here. The first percentage value always indicates the individual value of a tested dog while the second value is the breed average. The average also changes constantly when new dogs are added while the value of an individual dog remains the same. The more dogs are tested in a breed, the more meaningful the average value is. For example, if I have 1,000 tested dogs, this is a significantly better or more meaningful value than if I have only tested 10 dogs. We can see that the heterozygosity value is highest in the Malinois with 39% followed by the Tervuren with 33.13% and the Gronendale with 32.9%. There is a certain correlation between the coefficient of inbreeding and the heterozygosity value. This means that the higher the coefficient of inbreeding of a dog, the lower the heterozygosity value. There is always a correlation. I have already mentioned the coefficient of inbreeding. The coefficient of inbreeding is also a way of expressing genetic diversity. It is intended to indicate the probability that two alleles at a gene locus come from a common ancestor. If two dogs have a high consanguinity, the probability of a high genetic match is higher. Until now, we have always calculated COI values based on written pedigrees. The whole thing is very dependent on how many generations are available to us in these pedigrees. We are to a certain extent dependent on the number of generations available. What is the disadvantage of these pedigree calculated COI values? We have partially incomplete pedigrees. We have a limited number of generations, in most cases these COI values are only calculated on 5 or 6 generations. But one issue that also comes on top is the correctness of the pedigree. Is what is written in the pedigrees correct? In retrospect, pedigree analyzes were not carried out in the past. You have to trust what is written in the pedigrees. Various publications have shown that the COI value we calculate from the pedigrees is 5 to 10 times lower than the actual COI values of the dogs. This is also something we see when we compare genomic inbreeding coefficients, the COI values that we calculate on genetic markers with those that come out of pedigrees. We know that a high level of inbreeding has a really big impact on health. We have this issue of genetic diseases, problems with adaptability and we also have negative effects in terms of reproduction. This can have an effect on litter sizes, it can have an effect on the survival rate of newborns, but it can also be a problem in general with the receptivity of bitches or the willingness of males to mate. So we see that the problem extends into a wide variety of areas when we talk about loss of genetic diversity. It is therefore all the more important that we pay more attention to this issue in breeding. 
What is the advantage of a genomic COI value? Firstly, it is a much more accurate and completely independent method of calculating and breeding. We have genetic markers that we focus on and not information that is in pedigrees. In other words, I don't really care what is written in these pedigrees. What matters to us are the genetic markers of a dog that we have analyzed. In other words, we look directly into the dog and see the actual genetic situation, the degree of inbreeding. We can calculate these COI values for individuals as well as the heterozygosity values and we also calculate them in parallel as an average for the breed. Here we have again shown the three Belgian varieties. In this curve, which is shown in blue, we see all the evaluated dogs in the database. The curves shown in red refer to the breed. The blue line shows the value of the dog. As with the heterozygosity value, you can see that these values can really be very variable, depending on the dog and depending on the degree of inbreeding of the dog. Here we have a value of 8% for this Gronendale compared to the average of 11.86. This dog is below the average COI value breed, which is a desirable effect. At 22%, the turf urine is well above the breed average, something you would like to avoid. But this is not a limiting factor for breeding. Come back to that later. We have the Malinois here, which is at 6% and around the breed average. It varies from breed to breed and from individual to individual. It is not only different from individual to individual in a breed, but also actually with littermates. Here in comparison we have Turvurin full siblings from one litter. We have really massive fluctuations in the inbreeding values here starting at 5% and going up to 18%. Why is that? You have to imagine that each parent passes on 50% of the genetic markers to its offspring. But now it is not always the same 50%. Otherwise there would be a lot of clones. These 50% are mixed from the DNA of each parent and depending on how these 50% from both parents come together and what identical markers come together, the COI value of the offspring is lower or higher. We have the same phenomenon with this Malinois litter, although not as dramatic in terms of the fluctuation range. 5% to 10%. To believe that you test one dog in the litter to see where the COI value levels off and can then draw conclusions about all the others is actually a misconception. There really are very large variation from dog to dog. In this table I have shown the average COI and HET values of different breeds. The number of dogs tested is always listed as well. We have breeds such as the Leyenberger with a relatively large number of tested dogs or the Boxer and the Poodle. You can already get a very precise statement. For example, the Skipperkey with 21 tested dogs is also a good statement, but of course the more dogs there are, the more accurate this average value becomes. What we also see is that the COI values between the breeds are significantly different. Our COI values always take into account six generations. This is a value that is roughly comparable with the COI calculations on a pedigree basis. Here we see a representative with a relatively low COI value of 8% in Ridgebacks and a really high COI value of 23% at 6 generations in German Boxers. As you can see, depending on the breed, these COI values can be very different. They also represent the breeding strategies of the last years or the breeding history that has been followed in the individual breeds. If we now look again at this heterozygosity and these coefficients of inbreeding, it's important that we should not make breeding decisions based on these individual values. This means that a dog with a low COI value is not automatically better than a dog with a high COI value. When planning a litter, you always have to look at what both parents bring to the table. It may be that I have two dogs with very high COI values, but they are very well suited to each other and the mating enables me to actually lower the COI values in the offspring. You are probably wondering how this is supposed to work or how should I even find out as a breeder? That is why we have developed our matching tool or dog matching. We know 50% of the genetic material comes from each parent. Our matching tool determines a matching score by superimposing the genetic markers of the parents and looking at what the DNA of these two dogs has in common and or how much they differ from each other. This is the basic prerequisite for finding optimal breeding partners from a genetic point of view. When I talk about finding genetically optimal breeding partners, I'm talking about the fact that we can only take into account the information we have available with this tool. In this case, that means the genetic information of these dogs. 
Whether these dogs fit together phenotypically or behaviorally, that is more or less the task of the breeder. We are the genetic support tool that gives the breeder the opportunity to take genetic diversity into account or to maintain or improve it in the offspring. Genetic diseases will be taken into account with the next update, provided they have been tested. We also look at the population genetic value of a mating. In other words, not only from the breeder's point of view, but also whether the mating is beneficial to the population. And we take the DLA combination into account. These are certain genes of the immune system. In this area in particular, a high level of diversity helps the immune system to work more efficiently. How can you imagine the tool? You can match your dog against the database. You get a hit list of possible opposite sex partners. The matching score indicates how well or badly these dogs fit together. The higher the score, the better. The less genetic material the dogs have in common, the higher the score. I was just talking about the ranking within the population. If you click on a mating in the ranking, I get another detailed list. On the map, we can see what a mating might look like from the population's point of view. This is a genetic map, so to speak. Each of the gray dots represents a tested dog. The two partners are shown on the map. Both partners are connected by a line. The point in the middle of the line indicates the area into which the offspring would fall if the dogs were mated with each other. If you want to make a mating that is also beneficial for the population, then you have to try to ensure that the offspring fall into an area that is still free. We'll come back to how this works in a moment. Briefly for those who are already familiar with the tool. You may have noticed that these maps can rotate. This does not affect the data in any way. But it can actually happen that the map is suddenly upside down or mirrored. This happens when new dogs of a breed are added. To be fair, I have to say that we don't actually know what the cause is at the moment. We have been dealing with this issue for many years. It doesn't affect the data. It is simply the presentation that is changing. So don't be surprised if the number of dogs is up or down. Let's come back to the topic of ranking and the value of a mating for the population. We see here as an example a ranking of six dogs. Currently we do not take into account the genetic distance of the parents on the map in the ranking. We are in the process of changing this. At the moment you get a random ranking of all dogs that are at 100% score. If we click on each dog in this ranking, we get our map displayed. I have now picked out these maps. We can see with mating number one that the parents are very close together and the offspring would fall into an area where there are already many other dogs. With the second mating, the picture looks a little different. This means that we have two parents that are very far apart and the offspring would actually fall into an area where we don't have any dogs at all. Number three is again comparable to number one, meaning very close and in the area where there are many dogs. Number four as well. Number five, on the other hand, is interesting. Here, too, we have a very large distance with the offspring in the empty area. If you take the distances into account, then mating number 5 should actually be in first place. Number 2 would be second and the others would be graded accordingly. This will also be the case in the future. At the moment it is not yet taken into account. This means that you have to find out for yourself by simply checking these individual mating or matches in detail. Then you can see where the dogs lie, who is furthest apart and where the offspring fall in. In summary, the right partner is ideally the one with a very, very high matching score and who is very far apart. There is also the possibility of opening up new areas with targeted matings. Here we have an example of the boxer breed. We can see that we have many dogs on the right that belong to one area. Through this special mating we have managed to open up a new area. With this mating, I can again create new starting points. With the offspring that fall into this area, I can again occupy empty areas with corresponding breeding partners. So you can create a new starting point with certain matings. But you have to think in terms of generations and not just up to the current mating. An exciting story is also to look at brothers. Here is an example of my Kronforlender bitch. Of course, you might think that it doesn't matter which of these three brothers I take, because if I know one, I know them all. If we take a look, we realize that this is not the case. Here we have Theo, Twix, and Tender. If you look at the matching scores, you can see that the first two have a score of 100%, but the third only has a score of 90%.
all three have the advantage of long distances to my bitch, but tender would have a significantly lower score. This means that the coefficient of inbreeding in the offspring would very likely increase. From a population genetic point of view, it is therefore always an advantage to look at the litter brothers if a male does not fit so well. Genetically related or simply similar. We have chosen a nice mating, distance is good and the puppies fall into a range that is okay. Here is a second mating that would interest us because the male dog is exciting. Here we have the issue that the two dogs are much closer to each other. Both matings have a high matching score. The question is whether these dogs are actually so similar because they are related or where does this closeness come from. We can play through the whole thing. We have visualized the parents of this mating. We can see that the grandparents are very distant and genetically different. The phenomenon we see here is ultimately a genetic similarity that is present in these two dogs. It comes about by chance. This similarity is not due to common ancestors, but in this case the genetic material of these two dogs has unfortunately combined in such a way that they are relatively similar, resulting in this short genetic distance. So this is a factor that can also happen. Here we still have the parents of the second male. Now you are probably wondering how a breeder can assess this. Normally, the further apart the two lines of the two dogs are and the higher the matching score, the better. If you say, I'm still interested in the mating with the short line, then you can definitely do that. This map should be viewed in relation to the population. One exciting thing is predicting which area the offspring will fall into. It's always fascinating how precisely this works. You shouldn't imagine that the dogs are concentrated on just one point. You can see small deviations up or down. But you can also predict very well where the range will be. What will not happen if you mate these two dogs that the offspring will suddenly be over to the right? Here, for example, we have Oscar mated once with this bitch and once with this bitch. You can see the respective offspring in the circles. You can make really good predictions and you can work really well with them. This is our new searching tool. It will be integrated into my Farragon from next year. It is currently still running as a beta version. If you already want to use it, please send us an email. Here you can also search for breeds or special dogs. And you have the option of carrying out a very special matching comparison. So I don't match my dog against the whole database, but I match my bitch against a specific male dog. All you have to do is copy the ID by clicking on it and pasting it at the top. I would like to go back to the evaluation of values. As I said before, please be careful when you evaluate the COI or HET values of dogs. If you mate two dogs with a very low COI value, it does not automatically mean that they are super good at mating. Why? You really have to compare the genetic material in detail and you can only do that using the matching tool. It may be that the dogs are really genetically very similar and then you get a higher COI value in the offspring. But it may also be that the two dogs are inbred in different directions and then you can also get a benefit for the offspring by increasing the diversity. How can you imagine this? Here we have a male dog that was compared with three females. The COI value of the three females is roughly comparable. We have female 1 with 23, then female 2 with 22 and female 3 with 20%. We see clear differences in the matching scores, so 100% is great with this male. 97% is also still good. At 90% we are actually already in an area where we can say that there is already a genetic relationship, which would certainly lead to the COI value being raised in the offspring. DLA matching is an important topic. Variability is essential for these immune system genes because this is the only way they are able to react to different viruses, bacteria or other foreign invaders in the body. Some of you may be familiar with DLA analyzes. With our matching tool we can predict what the distribution will be. In this mating, we would have 25% homozygous offspring. You can see this from the fact that these numbers are shown in red and are identical. 75% would be heterozygous, which means different. Heterozygous is the desirable state. When we talk about red and call signs, it does not mean that the dogs will be sick or have other difficulties. It is simply a clear indication that they will be homozygous, so inherited equally from both parents. There is also the possibility that two parents have the same combinations. In this case, homozygous and homozygous result in homozygous again. Accordingly, the offspring also have 100% identical DLA. 
but we can also use this in the positive. Homozygous and homozygous can also result in heterozygous if the parents are homozygous but have different DLA genes. In this case, we get a combination in which all the offspring inherit 100% different DLA genes from the parents. This is comparable to the high COI values I was talking about. We have two dogs that may have potentially high COI values, which means they are highly inbred but are inbred differently and therefore, if I mate the two, something positive comes out for the offspring. To summarize again, with the matching tool we have a three-stage principle. We have the matching score, the genetic similarity and we have the DLA combinations. In future, not only the distance between the two parents will be taken into account, but also whether they carry the same diseases. This is crucial information, because such matings automatically disqualify themselves. The innovations planned for 2024 are the integration of the search tool I mentioned. The improvement of the ranking based on the matching scores and we will include further search criteria. For example, you can filter certain coat colors or whether they are FCI bred or dissident dogs. It will be possible to share dog information so that others can also see the results. That genetic diseases are taken into account, especially in matching. That you are immediately informed that two dogs are carriers of the same disease. In addition, a matching tool for DNA profiles. Other diseases can be uploaded, such as HD, eye or heart examinations. It's about creating a possibility where you as a breeder can collect information about your dogs and always have it available. Short take-home message from this webinar on genetic diversity. Maintaining genetic diversity is definitely important for breeding. Genetic diversity can be broken down to individual genes such as the DLA genes, but genetic diversity can also be taken into account very well by looking at the rest of the dog. Screening examinations, meaning genetic analysis procedures that provide a lot of information about genetic diseases, should of course be taken into account. Genetic details can be collected on matings, which should also be a way of making breeding decisions easier for the breeder. This data that is collected is not only relevant for a breeding club, but also for the individual breeder, so that he can assess where he stands with his breeding and where he stands in comparison to dogs of the same breed. This information can be used for future-oriented breeding management. At least as far as the COI values are concerned, you are independent of pedigree data. A very important point is to observe and evaluate breeding strategies and this is where the breeding clubs in particular are in demand. However, it is important to evaluate these breeding strategies again and again, to rethink them or, if necessary, to adapt them accordingly. So I have come to the end and would like to end this video with the wise sentence from Lee Trutman who said, While the right tools can never promise success, the wrong tools can ensure failure. And I would ask you to actually keep that in mind. It's better to have a strategy that doesn't always promise 100% success than to have no strategy at all. That actually leads to failure. That's it from my side. Here are our contact details if you have any questions, need information or have suggestions. You can reach us at the telephone number given or at support at farragon.at. Further webinars or videos will also follow. We have regular webinars on a wide variety of topics, including very detailed ones on genetic diversity, genetic testing in general and the DLA genes. Subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Facebook. Everything new that comes out will be posted there. I'll say goodbye at this point. I'm glad you were there and listened. We'll hear and see you again. Bye.